Hello there, guys. This is Sophia again with further AP Biology tips. Um, today, I hope to be discussing ecology. And actually, ecology is a fascinating uh, subtopic, especially given our previous study of biochemistry. Because I mentioned earlier in biochemistry that actually in a lot of biology, you will see essentially the transfer of energy as vital to biological relationships. And we kind of alluded to the fact that biochemistry helps us understand how this energy transfer works within the cell and between cells, so on essentially a microscopic level. Now, however, we're going to briefly sidetrack to ecology, and throughout ecology we'll see essentially that here we have energy transfer again, but on a macroscopic level. So we have this energy transfer from within the individual to other members of the population, to um, members of a community, to members of an ecosystem, to members of a biome, to members of the biosphere. Um, and this energy transfer we'll learn about is passed on through, in fact, the interactions of varied um, animals and plants, which include, of course, uh, predation and things like that. So ecology really is about energy transfer. And so for that reason, I'd like to preface my discussion of ecology with a discussion of thermodynamics, which will help you understand essentially why um, energy cannot be created, why it can't be destroyed, but why it has to be transferred, and why this energy transfer is so vital. So if you want, there's a link right here, um, and you can see the corresponding video on thermodynamics. Um, usually when I have an, uh, a higher level concept that isn't actually covered on AP Bio, I'll just link to another video, because um, these videos are mostly for people, again, uh, with whom I spend time at school. So I'd like to keep them um, AP Bio exam relevant, just so that we ensure you're not learning things that you don't have to. Um, I haven't ever thought that to be a bad thing, but nevertheless. So brief introduction there. <laughs> It's actually two minutes. Um, anyway, so starting with ecology. So I previously alluded just seconds ago to this chain that exists in ecology. And in ecology, we start with the individual, and then we go on to a group of individuals of the same species, and that is called a population. And from a population, we have several populations living together in the same area. For example, we get a community. And from a community, we mix, essentially, um, the living and non-living elements of a given area, and we get an ecosystem. And then, if we have several ecosystems of approximately the same type, we can call them a biome. And, of course, the collection of all biomes on our planet results in the biosphere, which is the area of Earth that is, in fact, inhabited by life. So that's the chain of, kind of, the levels of organization um, of ecology. Uh, and later on, when we take another look at the cell again, we'll talk about the anatomical levels of organization. So those are a little bit different. So again, um, organism or individual, population, community, um, ecosystem, biome, biosphere. That's our chain and that's what we'll be dealing with today. And today I hope to primarily discuss in this video uh, population dynamics. Uh, later we'll take a look at community dynamics, um, then we'll take a look at biomes themselves, and finally we'll fuse all that into a discussion of energy related items. So, to begin, population dynamics. Um, essentially, there are many characteristics of a population. And just to clarify, as we said before, a population is a group of the same individuals of the same species living in the same area. So, if you have, I mean, if you look at the human population, for example, I guess even if you say the population of Toronto, right? Toronto is a city. It's one area. Um, and if you say the population, you usually mean the human population. You're not counting cats and dogs. Um, so again, one species, one area, population. Um, and so populations, though, have many different characteristics. Um, one of them is actually size. So as you might expect, this is the total number of individuals uh, living in a given area that are basically members of the same species. So the total number of individuals in a population is the population size. Then we have the population density, which is essentially the number of individuals per unit of area or per unit of volume. So it's kind of like the density you've, um, you've experienced elsewhere, mass over volume in chemistry. But of course, this is number of individuals uh, per a unit of area. Okay. Um, and actually, you might think, oh, well, population sizes are easily documented. But while that may be true with humans who are capable of corresponding with one another, it can be very difficult to figure out how large a population actually is 
of a species that is not quite as communicative as ours. So essentially, there are many different ways of estimating population size because it gets very difficult to, in fact, do that very accurately. But um, one of them is a technique called mark and recapture. And this is exactly what it sounds like, actually. Um, in mark and recapture, you uh, collect basically specimens, you mark them, and you release them. And after some time, you come back, you gather up another number of specimens, and you see how many um, have in fact been marked. And this can give you a good idea of essentially the rate at which this population has increased if you take similar numbers. So that's just one of many techniques called sampling techniques, which are techniques geared at estimating the size of a population. So, so far we have two um, characteristics of population, size and its density. Okay? Um, there are more. One of them is dispersion. Uh, dispersion is exactly what it sounds like. You may have heard of dispersion in relation to seeds. Um, things disperse. Oftentimes you may have heard that expression. Basically, what it means is the distribution of individuals in that area. So, there are three types of dispersion. The first is clump dispersion. And this means either that all of the individuals in a given area are in the same place, or that they're in small groups. Okay, but basically what it means is that you don't see one individual of that species somewhere off by itself, another one over here, another one over there, you see them all together in some formation. And um, you might be wondering, well, why are we even talking about this? Why is this relevant? Sure, things can walk around in groups, but the idea is that there are always reasons for biological phenomena. and uh, for example, a cl clump dispersion is used uh, to protect uh, members of this dispersion. For example, um, sardines, when they essentially school, are protecting themselves from predators by t moving together in the same place at the same time, and they appear much larger than a single fish would. Um, other uh, organisms rely on one another for all kinds of feeding purposes. For example, lions hunt in packs, so they have to travel together as well. Um, you might even see bacteria living together right next to one another in a culture that almost looks like a single organism. So clump dispersions are pretty common and they're used for a variety of purposes. Um, another kind of dispersion is uniform dispersion. And this one sounds a little bit odd because you might be thinking, how, how does one get a, a perfectly kind of almost equidistant, um, spacing between living organisms? But let's say we have a species of plant that has roots that are one meter long. And again, we're talking about populations here. So in a given area, all of the plants there will be of the same species. So if every individual of these species has roots that are one meter long, um, it'll shove out any other plants trying to get their roots in that one meter area. And you should have plants that are spaced about one meter apart. So that's an odd example of uniform dispersion. But um, for example, humans actually uh, in some cases, impose it upon species as well. Uh, we plant cabbages in a uniform dispersion, for example, or any other crops, really. We, we do space them. Um, and the idea there, again, is to provide enough room for each individual to successfully survive. Uh, then we have, of course, random dispersion. <laughs> and this is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, no set pattern to the dispersion. Um, the organisms are usually individually living in different places. So that those are our three kinds of dispersion. So, so far, population dynamics, size, density, dispersion. Um, another thing that actually we should talk about when we're looking at populations is something called a survivorship curve. And again, um, as you will have noticed, a lot of these terms actually are exactly what they sound like. A survivorship curve is a graph that shows us essentially the distribution of the ages of individuals in a population. So it shows us, I guess, how many um, organisms we can expect to reach an older age, how many we can expect at a younger age out of a given group. So as you can see from here, on the um, y-axis we have the number of survivors, and on the x-axis we have their age. And each of these three curves, there are three types of curves shown here, type 1, type 2, and type 3. And uh, each of them has a slightly different shape, and I can explain briefly why those work as they do. So we have type 3, um, and as you can see, it begins high up, essentially, um, and then it rapidly goes downwards, and then it kind of evens out towards the, uh, towards as age progresses. So what this is telling us is that um, we have many, many individuals who are very young, 
And then there's a rapid drop in the number of individuals who survive towards maturation, and then this drop kind of evens out. So if you think about what kind of an animal could exhibit this curve, then you might hit upon a fish, right? Fish um, lay a lot of eggs, a lot of young fish are hatched, but because of predators, not many of them survive. So there's a rapid decline after hatchlings um, basically emerge, um, as they get eaten off, as they die of varied things, and then later on their population evens out. The type 2 curve um, basically declines over the course of life, so things die about evenly. Of course, at a young age they die less frequently, but they do die, um, and that kind of slopes normally downwards as life goes on. Um, this is characteristic of something like a reptile, which isn't usually at the nearer to the bottom of the food chain, but nevertheless has natural predators and has certain difficulties in life. Um, and finally, we have a type 1 curve, which, as you can see, uh, starts off quite high, remains quite high, and then drops down only as organisms get much older. And this is characteristic, unsurprisingly, of a species like ours, um, which actually, you know, most of our offspring, compared to uh, the case with other species, most of our offspring do survive to quite an old age and die of natural causes. So those are our survivorship curves, um, and they help us essentially determine yet another characteristic of a population, essentially a dispersion of ages. Um, what else? I'm just thinking, uh, we also need to talk about population growth, actually, speaking of this. Um, and this, we've seen now the number of survivors in relation to the age of the survivors, but we haven't looked at the actual age of the population. So, um, essentially, when a new population emerges, it may have been introduced from a new location, or it may have just started up by dint of, I don't know, um, uh, maybe geographic separation. Something happened to create a new group of individuals in a place. And usually, um, just when a population is introduced to a new area, it experiences something called exponential growth. And exponential growth is a term used to describe the kind of growth that just continues to grow with very, very, very little decline. So that's the first part of that graph that you see before you that has on um, on the uh, y-axis we have the number of individuals and on the x-axis we have uh, basically time as it goes on. So as you can see at the beginning we have um, basically the number of individuals rising rapidly uh, and this rapid rise is known as exponential growth. Um, as you might have guessed when we see exponential growth, we can gather that there's almost no predation, there's um, almost no parasitism, there's very little competition. Basically, the population is just growing without too much interruption. However, as a population settles into an area, eventually predators come in, things happen, and now you can see that basically um, the, the rate at which the population is growing starts kind of dropping and rising relatively gradually but always remains around a relatively stable limit. And that limit is known as the carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity, denoted K, is about essentially the number of individuals that can healthily occupy an area at a given time. So sometimes our population is a little above that, sometimes a little below that, but we stay in this range um, that's represented by the carrying capacity K here given as a line. Um, another concept that is associated with this that you can also see on that graph is um, a death phase. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Again, it's a rapid decline um, that occurs. Maybe a natural disaster happened, maybe something like that. Basically, a lot of organisms die very quickly. And uh, that, of course, you can see that drop on the graph. Um, there are different concepts actually associated with all of these phenomena, and one of them is uh, the biotic potential. And a biotic potential is, again, I keep saying this, but exactly what it sounds like. It's the maximum rate at which a population could grow given ideal conditions. So remember, this is an ideal. Uh, chances are it won't necessarily occur, but this is given virtually no predation, given no natural disasters, given very little competition, this is what the population could grow at. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. So that has been Ecology Day 1. And thank you for watching. I still have some things to talk about in relation to um, population dynamics. And of course, we still have to discuss community dynamics, biomes, and other ecology concepts. But I do have to stay within YouTube's limits. So bye. Hope you enjoyed that. Talk to you soon.